Hello, and welcome to the Family Drug Court webinar series, uh, Matching Service to Need. Today we're exploring some of the concepts of high risk and high need and what that means in implementing a family drug court. This is Nancy Young. I'm the director at Children and Family Futures, and I'm joined today by Dr. Doug Marlowe, who is the Chief of Science, Law, and Policy for the NASA National Association of Drug Court Professionals. Today's presentation is a follow-up from the NADCP uh, conference session that Doug and I did in May this year. Uh, and it also is part of a series that we're putting together uh, in terms of a white paper that will be coming out in 2015 on this same topic. Uh, so these are, are interesting concepts for us to explore, and the knowledge base that has been put together uh, by Dr. Marlowe and, and others that have done a lot of research on assessing risk and need are interesting ways for us to think about what does that mean in the context of family drug court and participants who bring their own risk and need as well as the components for children and family when we're talking about family drug courts. So let me turn things over to Dr. Marlowe. Thank you again for being with us today, and we look forward to your presentation. Thank you, Nancy. Um, my job here is going to be to review what is referred to as risk needs responsivity, also known as R&R. &R. This is a body of research that has been very well validated and proven in the criminal area. How it applies and if it applies in the family drug court area is part of what we will be uh, considering and addressing today. The basic axiom is what we call the high risk and high need principles. And the definitions are as follows. When we talk about risk in the criminal justice system, we are not necessarily talking about a risk of violence or dangerousness. Most risk assessment tools were not validated against violence. They were validated against failure on conditions. The likelihood that somebody will not return to court for adjudication, that they will fail on probation or parole, or that they will pick up a new offense, typically the same kind of offense that they had before. So it is a greater likelihood, essentially, of staying the same which is an analogous to the treatment concept of a poorer prognosis or the uh, judicial concept of a lower amenability to treatment. In other words, risk is the person is unlikely to change their spots. The leopard is unlikely to change its spots. The reason this is important is because when many people think of risk as a risk for dangerousness, they think that high-risk people should be excluded from treatment programs or excluded from intensive supervision programs when in fact the opposite is the case. High risk means they're not likely to succeed on their own and therefore these are the kinds of people we should be seeking for intensive programming such as drug courts. Needs are different than risks and they tend to be more dynamic and changeable and they are essentially the clinical disorders or functional impairments that um, criminal offenders often have that you know, impact their criminal activity. So if we think of risk as prognosis, then we would think of need as the diagnosis. Now there is a distinction between what we call criminogenic needs, which are needs that cause crime, and non-criminogenic needs that are usually the result of crime or incidental to crime. The most criminogenic need of all would be substance dependence or addiction. It is very often the cause or the exacerbator of criminal activity. But offenders have many needs, not all of which are criminogenic. For example, they have low self-esteem, they may have poor job histories, they may have poor educational histories, and very often those needs are the result of their criminal or antisocial lifestyle as opposed to the cause. And what research has taught us is that if you treat non-criminogenic needs before you treat the criminogenic needs, you actually make people worse. If you focus on the wrong things, you will actually increase criminal activity, increase substance use, decrease employment, and the like. Now, responsivity needs are an uh, exception to the rule. These are non-criminogenic needs that you still need to treat first, and what we're really talking about here is mental illness. 
most mentally ill people are not more likely to commit crimes. In fact, mentally ill people are more likely to be the victim of a crime than the perpetrator of a crime. However, you still have to treat mental illness early in the course of criminal justice supervision because if they're mentally ill, it's hard to engage in other uh, rehabilitative efforts if the person is too depressed or experiencing a uh, traumatic stress reaction or is psychotic. It's hard to do other types of interventions. And so we treat responsivity needs first. So the general rule of thumb is treat responsivity needs like severe mental illness, stabilize it immediately as soon as possible, focus on criminogenic needs. We'll talk about them, but they would often include uh, addiction. And then, and only then, after you have stabilized the responsivity and criminogenic needs, would you turn your attention to the non-criminogenic needs, which we'll talk about, which will include uh, things like poor employment, poor education, poor parenting skills, and the like. There is a big distinction that needs to be made between clinical and actuarial risk assessment. This is a common mistake that is made by many clinicians. One way to measure risk is to look at the magnitude of the harm. How serious is the harm? So drug possession would be considered less serious than theft because theft has a victim, and theft would be less uh, serious than child abuse because a child is being physically injured or failing to have their needs met. And so we focus on the result and the magnitude of the result. Another way to think about risk, which is actually more accurate, is the likelihood that the harm will occur. So drug possession would actually be higher risk than child abuse because drug possession is a far more common crime and people who are arrested for drug possession have higher recidivism rates than people that get in, char get in trouble for child abuse and therefore the likelihood would be higher for the drug possession. Now magnitude of the harm is the way human beings think. We focus on the outcome. And the result is that we overestimate the risk of serious events and we underestimate the risk of non-serious events. In other words, human beings have the highest error rates of all in assessing risk. And this is why human beings play the lottery. The odds of winning are infinitesimally small, and yet people play the lottery anyway because the magnitude of the win is perceived as being high. Most risk assessment tools, however, are focused on the likelihood of the harm and not the magnitude of the harm. Most risk assessment tools that are used in probation practice are validated against failure on supervision, against a general index of recidivism as the person arrested for anything. And so they're not looking so much at the magnitude of the, of the harm, but the likelihood that the person will fail and something will go wrong. As a result, risk assessment tools are always superior to human judgment and clinical judgment in estimating the likelihood of harm and even, frankly, the magnitude of harm that is actually experienced. Now, the most accurate diagnosis of risk, the most accurate assessment of risk, would be an interaction of magnitude times likelihood. So imagine that we have a scale, and this is an imaginary scale of magnitude. And on this scale, we're looking at the likelihood or the magnitude of a harm from 1 to 100, 100 being the highest magnitude. Now, there may be a very high likelihood that I will deliver a boring presentation, but the magnitude of the harm is very light. You'll just be inconvenienced for a half hour, and you will not suffer too much discomfort. Drug possession has a higher magnitude of harm because you are creating an industry for drug dealers, and that has effects on um, violence and other um, uh, crimes in the community. People who use drugs are more likely to commit crimes. So drug possession does have a harm to society, but it's a relatively lower on the scale. Theft offenses would have a higher magnitude of harm. Driving under the influence would be higher because the likelihood of hurting somebody or, or seriously injuring, killing someone is substantially higher. Right up to the highest harm that one could have would be child abuse. Now let's assume that the likelihood that a drug possession offender will do it again is about 75%, which is what it is. About three out of, five, three out of four drug possession offenders will recidivate, will engage in new drug offending behavior. So driving under the influence, on the other hand, the likelihood of it occurring after the first event is about 
So if we want to look at the magnitude times likelihood for drug possession, 75% chance of a 25 magnitude harm would be at 18.75 risk score. This is score based on this imaginary scale of magnitude. On the other hand, for driving under the influence, we would have a 25% chance of a higher magnitude harm. The risk would be the same. So you would be looking at the interaction between the two. The reality is that no tools do this high-level correct analysis of risk. So the way we handle that is we use tools that focus on likelihood, but then we allow clinicians to do an override if the magnitude is too high and that actually introduces more error into it. Clinicians will very often undermine risk assessment by imposing their judgment over the tool. The better way to go is to use local tools. So for example, we would have a tool that is looking at the likelihood of harm among uh, violent offenders or the likelihood of harm among sex offenders. And so we have tools that at least take into consideration the severity of the harm. Now, the axioms of risk-need responsivity are as follows. Interventions cannot be evidence-based unless they are matched to risk, or need, risk and need. It is very clear there is no such thing as a treatment or a program that works for everybody. And in fact, if you give somebody the wrong intervention based on their risk and need, not only will they not get better, they will in fact get worse. The higher the risk, the more intensive the supervision and contingencies sanctions and rewards must be, and vice versa. If you supervise somebody too intensely or impose too substantial consequences for a low-risk person, not only will you not make them better, you will make them worse. The higher the need level, the more intensive the treatment and rehabilitation services should be, and vice versa. We have learned through painful, bitter experience that if you provide treatment, for example, substance abuse treatment, to people who are not addicted and do not require substance abuse treatment, you actually make them worse. The likelihood of drug use goes up, the severity of drug use up goes up, the likelihood of crime goes up. Never, ever, ever, ever mix risk or need levels in the same treatment programs or groups. Risk and need are both extremely contagious. If you take a group of high-risk people, and put them together with a group of low-risk people, you will get a group of high-risk people. The high-risk people will raise the risk level of the low-risk people, and the low-risk people will have no impact whatsoever on the risk level of the high-risk people. We would therefore consider it to be malpractice to have groups that confuse and mix high-risk and low-risk offenders together, that mix addicted individuals and substance-abusing non-addicted individuals together, in the same groups, and unfortunately, although that is really contraindicated malpractice, it is also very, very common practice. As I said earlier, responsivity and criminogenic needs need to be treated first. If you focus on the, on the results of crime before you focus on the causes, you make people worse. As a result, you may need to have separate tracks or dockets in your program to keep your high-risk and high-needs people separate keep your high need and, high and low need people separate. Many people make the mistake of assuming that if this is a misdemeanor case, or this is a first time case, or this is a civil case, or this is pretrial, then the person must be low needs. That is not true. The nature of the case, the nature of the charges is not dispositive. You need to do a risk and need assessment of the individual using standardized tools that focus on the probability of harm occurring rather than clinicians overreacting or misreacting to their fears about the magnitude of the harm. The drug court target population, these are for criminal drug courts. The evidence of this is absolutely unambiguous. Drug courts that treat high risk and high need individuals, so they are both seriously addicted and or mentally ill, meaning they're high need, and they have high risk factors for treatment failure. We'll mention what those are in a minute. If they are both high risk and high need, the drug court reduces crime about twice as much as programs that serve low risk or low need offenders and are 50% more cost beneficial. So all the effects of drug courts are attributable to treating the right people who need that intensity of supervision and treatment, and drug courts, that are the term is sometimes used, 
net widening or creaming or skimming, taking the easy cases, are actually providing too much treatment, too much supervision. Not only are they not making people better, they are actually making people worse and they are wasting resources. Now, some drug courts make the mistake of confusing predictor variables with moderator variables. Researcher evaluates a drug court and looks to see who does better in the drug court. The researcher finds out that women do better than men, that older people do better than younger people, that people with prior felonies do, better, do worse than people who are first-time offenders, and therefore they assume, well, following that logic, drug courts should treat first-time offenders who are female, older, and have never been charged with a prior offense. In other words, treat the people who do best. That is wrong reasoning because those same people do just as well or, um, and better than high-risk people on probation or pretrial supervision or diversion to treatment. In other words, those people do well wherever you send them. And we measure the effects of drug courts by comparing how well people do in drug court to how well they do on the alternative program. If you take easy to treat cases, they do well in both programs. The drug court costs more money and it has no better outcomes. So you actually want to look at what are called moderator variables. These are individuals where the effect size of drug court, the difference between drug court and the alternative is larger for those people. And so instead of finding that drug courts have do better with low-risk people, they actually do better with high-risk people. Being low-risk predicts a better outcome, but being high-risk means it moderates the effects of drug courts and makes drug court more valuable, more effective for high-risk people. The most prevalent risk factors, uh, and time will not allow us to go through them in detail, but what makes somebody high-risk is the younger you are, generally the more impulsive the more heedless of danger you tend to be, the less likely you are to think before you act, to learn from negative experiences. And so younger offenders, especially prior to 25 years of age, tend to be higher risk for treatment failure. The earlier the onset of delinquency or substance abuse, the more likely the person is to have a chronic and treatment refractory course. The past is always the best predictor of the future. So the more times you've been convicted in the past, the more times you have failed in treatment in the past or failed on probation in the past, the more likely it is that you will fail this time and therefore you need a more intensive intervention such as a drug court program as opposed to a diversion to a lesser intervention. Violent offenders, offenders with antisocial personality disorder or, psych or psychopathy, also known as sociopathy, the more antisocial the person, the higher the risk and therefore we should be targeting those people for intensive programming, not using those criteria as an exclusion to keep them out of our programs. A family history of crime or addiction. If you have close relatives who are addicts or engaged in criminal activity, the, uh, the odds are that there is a genetic predisposition in your family, which means you're more likely to have a more severe and treatment refractory um, uh, type of disorder. You're also more likely to have watched and uh, drug use and criminal activity occurring at an early age so that genes and environment, social learning are conspiring to create a harder to treat case and therefore people with family histories of crime or addiction tend to be harder to treat, have a poorer prognosis and therefore should be targeted for more intensive programming. Finally, criminal or substance abuse associations, the old adage that you are the company you keep is true. The more people you spend your time with who are engaged in substance use or criminal activity, the greater the risk for treatment failure, for probation failure, for failure in the criminal justice system, and therefore the more important it is to impose more uh, stringent conditions. These are the examples, the primary examples of what most risk assessment tools are looking for and deciding whether or not somebody is, has a high likelihood of failure and therefore must be supervised more intensely and receive more stringent consequences, rewards for doing well, and sanctions for doing poorly. When it comes to the prevalent uh, need factors, substance dependence, also referred to as addiction, is the most criminogenic of all the needs factors. I do want to make it clear here 
that this does not include substance abuse. It does not include substance use or misuse. People can use drugs, abuse drugs. They may be a danger to others because of their drug use. But unless they have developed a neurological brain disorder that we call addiction, where their use has become compulsive and there is a dysfunction of the central nervous system, it is not a clinical issue. It is a risk issue. It is a supervision issue, not a treatment issue. Major Axis I psychiatric disorders like bipolar disorder, uh, major depression, schizophrenia, those kinds of disorders are responsivity disorders. They must be treated. And if they, are con if they are mixed with substance use, they become highly criminogenic and they certainly then must be uh, the target of immediate intervention. Frontal lobe or executive uh, disinhibition uh, tend to be high criminogenic needs. Lack of employment skills, that's not the same thing as being unemployed. Some people are unemployed because they don't wish to work. They're not motivated for work. They're, they have not a, endorsed pro-social um, um, roles in life, such as employment. For those people, it is not a need issue. But for people who lack the skills to be able to keep a job, for them, it is a prevalent criminogenic need. People who cannot um, uh, take care of their home, cannot take care of their, their self, their hygiene, uh, meet their own needs for food, individuals who lack those basic living skills, those people will also have a, a need for clinical treatment. This is not necessarily the same thing as simply having unstable living arrangements because some people have unstable li living arrangements because they're not motivated to take care of themselves or their family or their children. They basically live off, sponge off sometimes other people, and that is a risk issue as opposed to a need issue. But if people are seriously disoriented, disabled, suffering clinical symptoms like addiction, serious psychiatric disorders, then we must treat those disorders in order to uh, reduce crime. If we bring it all together, risk, which we also refer to as prognosis, need, which is also referred to as diagnosis, then broadly speaking, we have four kinds of people. We have people who can be both high risk and high need. So for example, somebody who is seriously addicted to drugs or alcohol and or mentally ill and or has seriously deficient um, uh, daily living skills ability, seriously de uh, deficient employment skills, and those same people have multiple failures in treatment before. They have um, perhaps prior convictions. They may have a family history. They may have antisocial personality. So they are both high risk and high needs. Those individuals need a combination of intensive monitoring and accountability. If you are not bringing them in frequently for reviews in front of the court, if you are not imposing gradually escalating rewards for doing well and sanctions for doing poorly, if you are not doing regular drug testing, then you are not holding these people accountable. If you do not hold them accountable, they will not get better. In fact, they will get worse. They also need treatment because they have serious clinical syndromes. If you do not provide good quality evidence-based treatment, they will not get better. They will get worse. And finally, they're going to need habilitation services that helps them to adopt pro-social roles and uh, change their criminal thinking patterns and also learn adaptive skills such as learn how to keep a job, learn how to get a GED, um, improve their educational attainments and the like. If you don't have all three of those legs on the tripod, the uh, tripod will tip over, the case will fail. For the upper right quadrant, you have people who are high needs. They may be seriously addicted and or mentally ill, but they do not have those risk factors that portend failure in treatment. For those individuals, you can put them on a more treatment-oriented track within a drug court um, where they would be focused on their need for substance abuse and mental health treatment, as well as habilitation services uh, focused on job training, and literacy training, and the like. But the last thing in the world you would want to do is have people in the upper left quadrant treated together with people in the upper right quadrant, because when you mix risk levels, you make people worse. Lower left quadrant, you have people who are high risk but low needs. So they may be antisocial. They may have prior treatment failures. They may have 
family histories of crime and addiction, but they are not addicted or seriously mentally ill. Those individuals could be in a supervision-oriented track, focusing on uh, monitoring and accountability and consequences, and job training and literacy training and those kinds of interventions. But these individuals do not need, nor should they have, substance abuse treatment, because when you give treatment to people who do not need treatment, you make them worse. And finally, in the lower right quadrant, people who are low risk and low needs should not be in intensive treatment program, should not be an intensive supervision program. They should be in a diversion track to get them out of the justice system as quickly as possible, focusing on some psychoeducation, focusing on some um, uh, uh, negative contingencies if they don't do well, and the goal is to get them back on track and out of the system as quickly as possible. What we have learned in the criminal context is that all the effects of drug courts are accounted for by participants in the upper left track, upper left quadrant. Drug courts were created for people who are both high risk and high needs. That's who does well. Individuals in the other tracks are getting too much supervision or too much treatment or too much both and therefore you need to ratchet down the intensity of supervision, the intensity of treatment for those people if you are going to be taking them into your drug court in the first place and because they are not the traditional population that drug court should be targeting. To bring it all together, assessment is key. Most of our strongly held beliefs, assumptions, and heuristics are flat out, unabashedly, completely, and totally wrong. All of the things that we assume that we understand about people, what makes people high risk, how we define high risk, what high risk people need, what makes, what decides whether somebody needs treatment. Most of our assumptions are absolutely wrong and usually make people worse. Structured assessments are always superior to professional judgment. Human beings will jump to the magnitude of the harm and will ignore the probability of the harm and as a result will over-assess risk. Um, and over-treat and over and over-supervise. It is critically important to, set, to assess the person, not only the case. If you are deciding what people get based on what crime they've been charged with or what, um, uh, what, what um, uh, case has been filed against them in child welfare, if you're basing it on purely the aspects of the case, you are probably misdiagnosing, misassessing the individual making the individual worse. You need to get a clinical assessment and just like it would be malpractice for a physician to treat somebody without diagnosis and prognosis, it is malpractice for us to intervene with people without first getting a diagnosis and a prognosis or to use our terminology, a risk and need assessment. It is important to assess the person prior to the entry of conditions. Many people are brought into a drug court or a family court, once they're in the program, they're sent to the treatment program where a diagnosis is reached. Well, the time to get a diagnosis is before you decide whether or not somebody should be in the court in the first place. Because once they're in the program, if they're not diagnosed correctly, they're being mixed with people who are, di who are addicted and they may be getting services they do not need. It is critically important to have locally validated tools and to limit your clinician overrides unless they are extremely well justified. Generally speaking, when clinicians use their judgment instead of the tools, they undermine the effectiveness of risk and need assessment. The, train, the evaluators must be trained and competent. The GIGO uh, notion of garbage in, garbage out is critical here. If your clinicians are not skilled in diagnostic assessment, they will say somebody is an addict when that person is not an addict. They will say somebody is mentally ill, they have trauma disorders and, uh, and depression and anxiety disorders when they do not. And when you give treatment to people who do not need those tre that treatment, not only are you wasting valuable treatment, but you're harming individuals. So that is risk needs responsivity theory from the uh, criminal side in a nutshell. Um, I will turn it over now to Dr. Young to um, discuss uh, the context of family courts, and then we should have time for uh, questions and discussion later. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Doug. We really appreciate your time to put this together and to uh, help us think through what does this mean in the context of family drug courts. 
And I've been asked today to try and do some of that translation, if you will, about how does this relate to family drug court and what we're trying to do with uh, understanding the scale of family drug courts, the scope of services, the population that uh, is being referred to family drug courts. Let me start with the good news is the reason why this becomes so important is that over the past decade uh, and has been summarized a couple years ago now by, by Doug and Dr. Carey uh, in a research update that summarized, oh, about 14 or so uh, local family drug court evaluations. And from the, that work, as well as the work of the regional partnership grants and the children affected by methamphetamine grants over the last couple years that were conducted by Children's Bureau and by SAMHSA, we know that there are some very consistent findings that participants in family drug courts have higher completion rates in treatment. Uh, overall, they have shorter time in out-of-home care. Uh, they have higher family reunification rates, uh, lower rates of termination of parental rights, uh, fewer new child welfare petitions after a reunification has happened. Uh, in fact, that is probably the most dramatic of the data is that the recidivism, if you will, in the context of new petitions of abuse or neglect are substantially lower in family drug court participants than uh, than in the data in communities as a whole, uh, and generating substantial cost savings for child welfare agencies uh, in particular. So let's talk a little bit about the, the context then of family drug courts and just sort of setting the stage so that we can get into the discussion about uh, predictors of risk and the need for treatment in the context of child welfare practice uh, by, by just taking a step back and, and talking just a bit about the context of the creation of family drug courts. Um, initially was built on the adult drug court model uh, that substance abuse treatment and case management services were the core of intervention. Uh, and the addition in family drug courts emphasizing the coordination of those two functions in the context of child welfare services. There was also some initial growing pains, if you will, about how to marry up the requirements of the child welfare system that is focused on the safety, paramount, the safety of the child. Uh, and the, the long-term well-being of the child in the context of the recovery needs of parents. And I think uh, many of the folks who on the call who have been working in family drug courts for some time uh, are familiar with some of the early arguments about family drug courts having too much emphasis on the recovery of the parents and not paying enough attention to the safety and the well-being issues for the child. And I think we've come a long way uh, over the last 15 years to understand how to bring that together in whole family kinds of approaches. We know that family drug courts draw upon the strengths of assessment for both the assessment of risk and needs in the child welfare context as well as the alcohol and drug treatment needs uh, that Putting those together puts together a family plan that recognizes the recovery needs of the parent, uh, the recovery outcomes that are being sought uh, at the same time as child welfare is looking at the safety uh, and well-being of the child. Early on, there were also a lot of discussions about the goal of family drug courts that the incentive for the parent to participate uh, was about the, the opportunity to reunify with their children or family maintenance, meaning that the child would not be removed at all, but that participation in the family drug court would generate these outcomes. And I think, again, some of the growing pains has been to recognize that permanency for the child is 
one of the very important outcomes in child welfare, and that when the family drug court is focused on the permanency for the child, it drives services in different ways about how we look at the timing of getting uh, adults into treatment, getting the assessment and the match to treatment done, uh, and that, that incentive and the goals of family drug court, we've seen some shifts over the last decade in particular as uh, child welfare has, has focused more so on those three components of uh, safety, permanency, and well-being. And we hear frequently about the, the failure of participating in family drug courts, the, uh, those that drop out, that that is uh, almost equal to that would then mean a termination of parental rights. But we know from the data that that's not correct, that there are many parents who may not actually complete the drug court program. Um, we've been able to look at that in some ways in terms of why, and sometimes the requirements of completion mean that the getting back to work, uh, being able to reunify with the parent uh, meant that the completion of the drug court didn't happen, and yet they were able to reunify and termination of parental rights, in fact, did not take place. So some of those components of the consequence of failure in the adult drug court looks very different than what happens in the context of a family drug court and what kinds of goals are trying to be achieved. And yet there are many similarities in the way in which the child welfare system looks at risk and needs as the criminal justice system looks at predictors of risk and need for treatment. Let me take just a minute, though, to, to put this context of safety, risk, and need. The, the primary assessment functions, if you will, of the child welfare service, of child welfare services. And that safety assessment that comes into play immediately at the time of the call to the hotline. Is this something that generates an immediate same-day response? Is that a 48-hour response, or is that something that can be a longer-term response? And the safety assessment that's conducted by those initial workers that go out to do that, that initial investigation about the current conditions within the family, is it an immediate threat of danger to the child? If it is, are there protective capacities within that home, within that family, or within the extended family that manages those threats of danger sufficiently that there's not an immediate need to remove that child. So safety in the context of child welfare, very much about that immediate need of the child to be placed in protective uh, custody or to have enough support in the family, in the home, to prevent that placement from happening. Compared to, in some ways, the risk, if you think about that immediate ER, the emergency response of the safety, and the risk in this context of the likelihood that maltreatment will occur or reoccur in the future. This is the, these are the definitions from the National Resource Center for Child Protective Services that have done a great service for the nation in trying to help child welfare understand these components and to put mm -hmm. assessment tools in place that differentiate those predictors of safety, those predictors of risk, and to put those out in a way that child welfare can look at those two concepts and understand the immediate safety factors versus the risk that this child may be harmed and risk factors that this child may be harmed, either from abuse or chronic neglect, may in fact mean that the child is put into protective custody when there are not the kind of capacities within the family, within the home, to protect that child. And then the third concept to really be explored, the idea about the need, the service priority. This kind of assessment of the family need typically happens not really until after sometimes there's a jurisdictional hearing. 
So the safety and the risk assessment is happening during the investigative phase. And then if the child has been removed, at the court hearing in which there is jurisdictional hearing and disposition of the case, at that point typically is when there is a service need assessment that's done. Now, we recognize that in many family drug courts, those needs assessments in terms of the need for substance abuse treatment, the need for mental health, domestic violence, the other components in the family, housing in particular, those service needs may actually happen, and as Doug suggests, need to happen before admitting someone to a family drug court in order to make sure that this is the right person who's getting in, that this is somebody who needs substance abuse treatment. But notice that those are, are distinct from the components about does this child need to be removed, the safety and the risk factors. The need for treatment may, in fact, be very high in a parent in which there are are conditions in the family, conditions in the home, that the threat of danger is minimal, and so therefore we're not removing this child, but the parent may have very high treatment needs. And I think that the, the way of being able to separate those out is very instructive with the, the um, examples from the criminal justice arena to make sure we're on board with understanding who's getting into family drug courts and, importantly, where are we spending our resources for that. So let me take a minute, although we've, we've gone through these in some detail, let me just take a minute and think through the ways in which those safety decisions about, about initial emergency response safety, um, whether the child can remain in their home, how those threats will be managed so that safety is reasonably assured. There are no guarantees, we recognize that, uh, but is there caretaker capacity? Perhaps it's not with the birth parent. Perhaps it's with the spouse or with the, uh, another person that's in the home that, that means that the child doesn't need to be removed. For families that are affected by substance use, this safety assessment is important that we understand those drug-related, alcohol-related safety threats to evaluate the capacity of parents to protect their children. And frankly, we don't see a lot of jurisdictions around the country that adequately pay attention to those kinds of predictors of risk for the child at the emergency response level. There may be some things that have been put into training. There may be some things that have been put into that safety assessment. But it's one of the questions we often ask when we, when we go in to help a community to think through uh, this initial phase of, a set of safety assessment, is how are you understanding those risk factors in the home that may be a safety threat to the child, again, either for abuse or in the case of parents with a substance abuse problem, much more likely to be ne uh, neglect kinds of issues. What's different than what we've been hearing, particularly in Doug's um, explanation of predictors, of criminogenic um, uh, predictors, is that there are child factors that also increase risk. So, in that family, understanding that there's a child under the age of six, we know that that increases the risk of neglect or future abuse. That children with special needs, that girls may be at higher risk than boys of sexual abuse in particular, although that's very um, a small percentage of the overall child welfare population, as I think most of the participants today recognize that the, most lar the largest proportion of uh, kids with abuse or neglect are those that are in the neglect ca uh, category. Uh, that younger children uh, are higher risk than older, in particular infants under the age of one are considered to be the highest risk group. Uh, the child health and behavior uh, and children that are born with a positive toxicology screen are all factors that are predictive of risk to that child, meaning that that is a, a characteristic of the children 
that need to be placed into the context of the risk assessment for the parent in terms of the risk of future abuse or neglect. And then there are parent factors. Many of these are very, very similar to the kinds of predictors that uh, have been well researched in the criminal justice arena. Uh, we heard Doug talk about the, the age of the beginning of substance use, and particularly if we're talking about a younger parent, uh, the higher the risk of maltreatment. Uh, that substance abuse and mental health issues, when we look at overall risk factors in the data that are submitted to the federal government, that those are the most frequent risk factors for maltreatment that are quantified. Um, history of foster care themselves, again, the lower educational level, uh, the father's experience of abuse, particularly physical abuse in childhood, uh, the lack of social support for the family, uh, and some of those other uh, maternal employment factors that are part of those predictors of risk. So as we think about the way in which these factors in the criminal justice arena and child welfare arena interrelate, there are adult factors, child factors, and then the parenting and the family dynamic itself. So some of those components related to being in a single family household, family history of interpersonal violence. Uh, and the factors that affect the parent's ability uh, to actually parent. Um, are, these are things that are well researched in the child welfare arena that are the additional component that are assessed in that phase of understanding risk to the child that are unique in this context uh, for, for understanding the risk and that not quite yet the needs of the parent. Many uh, safety and risk assessment tools that are, are available in child welfare, one of the most frequent ones that's being used in many states across the country, structured decision making or shorthand of SDM, uh, which takes the approach of uh, actuarial data uh, to look at risk assessment as well as the clinical judgment of workers uh, that com comprise many of these different assessment processes that I've been talking about. The very initial intake of the emergency response and the safety assessment. That risk assessment that happens during the investigation phase. Often that family strengths and needs happens before the dispositional hearing so that they understand what service plan needs to be put in place. Uh, the possibility of having that risk reassessment done many times during the life of a case uh, and a reunification assessment. So all of these tools are part of the structured decision-making model. Uh, and you see the link uh, for where to find that if you are in a state that's not currently using FDM or structured risk and assessment tools. So when we look at those common factors of risk uh, to, of crime and risk of child welfare, future involvement of abuse or neglect, the common factor of understanding substance dependence addiction or addiction and those other components that Doug spoke about, the mental health concerns, in common those issues of age or first year. Uh, for, I'm sorry, age of first use and the family history of addiction. Those are very similar to what we're hoping child welfare is looking at when we're, they're looking at risk to, uh, in their context of risk of child abuse and neglect. But bringing in those factors that are unique to child welfare services that are looking at those issues that the child characteristics and the family characteristics that may be contributing to a higher risk of future abuse or neglect. Another common tool that's used in terms of understanding family strengths and needs are the domains that are listed here under the NICFAS, uh, the North Carolina Family Assessment Scale. This is a tool that Children and Family Futures has used 
uh, quite often with some of our evaluation activities uh, and to understand these different domains of family strengths and needs. And you see that there are uh, com components of the capabilities of the parent, and that's where we typically find the use of alcohol and drugs that interfere with parenting. There are scales that measure these components in the parental capabilities. But you see that there are nine other domains about family strengths and needs that are important to understand in the context of the case plan. Now, depending on the family drug court model, there may be a case plan in that family drug court that's monitoring all of these kinds of service needs. We hope that's the case, that the team is aware of the, the family safety factors, the, the readiness for reunification factors, uh, the things that are needed in self-sufficiency, uh, the health care uh, needs of the family. But all of these domains come into play in terms of understanding what that service plan needs to look like. And that looking at the parent, the child, and the family becomes important in the context of family drug court to have a family plan, a family support recovery plan that addresses each of these different issues. Um, and that's how we have seen in many cases the family drug court evolve over the last decade to understand that the the urgency of the substance abuse treatment needs, mental health needs, domestic violence needs, are all components of the family drug court. But as family drug courts and uh, become more family-centered, understanding these other needs of the child, needs of the family as a whole, particularly those other issues related to family counseling, I mentioned already housing, uh, the domestic violence needs, that all of those become important components of understanding assessment. So just to sort of summarize, that when we bring the family drug court together, that there are these three different primary partners we usually talk about, that, and that child welfare has a responsibility to understand the child risk and safety needs of the child and the family that the alcohol and drug treatment provider has the responsibility and accountability for assessing the parent's need for treatment, the level of care, the areas of life functioning that are being affected, the recovery supports that are needed to be put in place. And the court provides that oversight, ensuring with their ultimate responsibility the safety and the well-being of the child as well as ensuring that the access to services, the reasonable efforts criteria, have reasonable efforts been put in place to ensure that that child either did not need to be removed or can be reunified with their family. So that sort of summary slide, I, I hope, kind of sets this context of then understanding the, the components of child welfare practice and how we think about that in the context of, of use and addiction of, uh, and treatment needs. So let's think just a minute about the child welfare intervention. And we often look at that as being a continuum, right? So uh, low-risk families may be deferred at that emergency response level or at that intervention of the investigation that says an alternative response is here's a referral to community resources. These are not cases that we're going to further investigate. It's an on assessment track. And we're going to make some referrals to the community. And then if you will, if you think about this continuum of cases that may have allegations of abuse or neglect, but the allegations are not substantiated. So an unsubstantiated charge. And we think of those as being, as, as Doug was saying, the magnitude, right? The magnitude of the harm that an unsubstantiated case may in fact have a lot of risk factors, but the child welfare hasn't been able to substantiate that that incident actually happened. 
versus a substantiated case in which, yes, we have proof. We have been able to substantiate those charges in court to say that those allegations of abuse or neglect happened. And then making determinations about, is that child going to be safe with capacities in the home in order to maintain that child in home without having to be removed? Or is that a removed child that then goes into a family reunification services track? So we have this continuum of child welfare interventions, right? What we typically find, however, is that the context of the substance use, and if you will, the continuum of, of a parent who is using versus a parent who is addicted and needs treatment is often a complete mismatch with the child welfare intervention. In other words, you may have a parent who is referred to community resources because the risk factors for the child were either unsubstantiated or were not found to be an immediate safety concern, so the family was referred to community resources. Unfortunately, we often find, or sometimes find, that the need for treatment, the assessment of is this parent somebody who has an addiction, has a high need for treatment, has a not high need for services, substance abuse mental health services, but they may be being referred to a community resource. Or they may be being served in home, but yet still may have a high need for treatment. This mis this mismatch between the child welfare intervention and the assessment of need for treatment is part of the goal of understanding how do we bring those things together. Because in fact, you may have someone who had a very high substantiated child neglect case, high risk child neglect case, and that child was removed. And in fact, that parent may have been under the influence at the time that the report was filed. But they, in fact, don't meet criteria of substance addiction. They may need some other kind of intervention about the fact that they were using and their child was neglected. But they may not have a diagnosis of addiction that required them to be in services. And yet, what we often find is that there is one response. There is one track. There is one way in which a parent who is at a use misuse and their child was neglected it is treated the exact same as a person with an addiction whose child may have had unsubstantiated allegations. It's this understanding and this assessment is key that I think we're really trying to, to emphasize. So if we look at that again from those cases in which we're looking at um, no intervention, right, referral to a community resource versus child welfare is providing in-home services. So we used to call those, you know, voluntary services. We used to call them uh, other kinds of programs, family maintenance programs, but that the child has not been removed versus that continuum of the child has been removed. If we look at this idea of addiction and the way the new DSM looks at mild, moderate, and severe addiction, making sure that we're matching that moderate and severe mild addiction, which we used to refer to as a use or abuse, um, with where that child is placed. Because again, you may have someone who has a very severe addiction who served in home because there are other factors in the family that allow that child to stay at home, a, a, a non-addicted caregiver in the home, or someone who is providing that support to the child. That means that the child doesn't need to be removed. Or in those removed cases, again, having that incident of 
the parent was under the influence of alcohol, we see this in DUI, driving under the influence cases. That put that child at very high risk. The child may have, in fact, been removed because of an accident that the parent is in. Um, and, you know, not having the assessment to know, is this person someone who needs treatment for an alcohol addiction, or is this somebody who was not does not have the alcohol addiction needs to happen. So again, this range of substance dependency and how we assess that, and as Doug cautions us, to not be mixing those folks who are at the, the mild addiction phase in the new terminology of the DSM, or what we would typically use in terms of use and abuse, versus someone who has an addiction who needs very structured treatment services that's paying attention to the life areas of functioning that need to be addressed. Part of the reason why we feel so, if you will, passionate about this is that we know that in substantiated abuse or neglect cases, 80 to 85% of those children either stay home or they return home. So not assessing the addiction, not ad addressing the treatment needs of the parent when that child is either staying home or is going to go home, meaning they're going to be reunified, if the vast majority of children in child welfare across the country go home or stay at home, and we're not making the connection to understand the treatment needs of the parent, we're placing that child in a situation in which that recidivism, that likelihood of repeat maltreatment has not been addressed because of that factor of addressing the addiction. And, you know, I don't, I don't mean to be, you know, um, accusatory on any one child welfare system, um, we certainly recognize that uh, their hands are full. But what the point is, is how we make those connections to their partners in their communities to make sure that they're getting the substance abuse assessments and that they're getting the treatment resources that are needed uh, for the parents who are coming in. And how does that happen? This is a repeat of a part of what Doug also presented. The structured assessments are critical. It's always far superior to professional judgment. We hear all the time from child welfare workers or even the drug court, the family drug court coordinators that say, if I had to bet on that family, it would have never been the family that I would have bet on because they weren't using a structured tool to really understand the treatment needs of the parent. And in fact, in the uh, National Study on Child and Adolescent Well-Being, when they used diagnostic criteria and what was documented in the case record, uh, two-thirds, almost two-thirds of confirmed drug or alcohol dependence by using a, a tool among substantiated abuse and neglect cases missed that by the frontline workers' assessment. So if we're missing it in two-thirds of the cases, it cannot uh, make that, that urgency more profound. Structured assessment of the treatment needs of the parent is critical to understand how do we address the risk for the child. What does that mean in, child, in family drug court practice? How is your family drug court partnered with your alcohol and drug treatment providers to work with the child welfare staff to bring that expertise of the screening and the assessment into the child welfare practice. Is there a co-located substance abuse counselor uh, that has the assessment skills that are needed that's part of your team? How is the family drug court supplementing its child abuse and neglect risk assessments to look at substance use and the impact on family? Is it something that's being integrated into the risk and safety assessment protocols, or is that, oh, we're going to refer that over to someone else and we're going to wait for somebody else to understand that? Is there screening that's happening at the emergency response level? Is the expertise brought in during that continuum of risk 
and investigation assessments to understand what is the impact, what is the level of need uh, for substance abuse. And how is your family drug court developing both the legal and the clinical eligibility criteria for enrollment? Um, and how is it put in place in a standardized fashion? If we think then about the, the term and the way in which we're looking at responsivity, how do we ensure that that higher risk has the more intensive supervision and the contingencies that are needed to put in place, um, as well as the need for the continuum of services and the more intensiveness of treatment and habilitation services and vice versa? How is that put in place with the higher risk to the child in the in-home cases? Because in fact, in theory, if a child is removed, the risk to the child has gone down to minuscule, right? The child's no longer living in that home. The higher the risk to the child is in in-home cases. We hear that all the time, and all of the child welfare folks on the phone know that that is what they get concerned about. That's who they lose, lose sleep over. This child is remaining in the home, and did I make the right call? How do we put that in the context of the higher the need for treatment for the parent in an out-of-home case and making sure that the more intensive the supervision of the parent status and, importantly, the compliance with the treatment plan that's put in place is needed? And six-month review hearings are not sufficient. Again, Doug made this parallel in the adult drug court. If you wait until the next permanency hearing after jurisdiction or the jurisdictional and the dispositional hearing that takes place at 30, 45, 60 days into the case. And the next time you are bringing that parent back to court is not until a six-month review hearing. All kinds of stuff has happened during that six-month review. And if you think about it clinically, when we're asking parents to completely change the coping skills, destructive coping skills that they've been using, and now they need additional support to be able to achieve recovery, if we're not doing some check backs much more frequently than what's ordered by the dependency court system in putting in place status review hearings and compliance hearings on how is the parent doing, were they able to make it to all of their sessions, what kinds of supports are needed to make that happen to ensure that they are being prepared for reunification and being able to safely parent their children? How do those appropriate matches between the child welfare intervention and the treatment options take place? We hope that we're looking at those child welfare interventions in the context of substance abuse treatment and not saying that that's a linear match, per se. Right? It doesn't necessarily match up that an in-home case would only need a very low level of education and prevention in the world of substance abuse, or that outpatient services are going to be adequate because this parent was able to maintain custody of the child. It's the, this differentiation of the way in which child welfare concepts of risk and need play out in the concepts of substance abuse, treatment needs, addiction, and what kinds of structure, level of care is needed for that particular parent. And that matching is, can, is really the key. So you may be a, a family drug court coordinator that says, so what does that mean? Does that mean that we have to have separate dockets? if we have in-home cases versus out-of-home cases? Perhaps that's what it means. If we look at the treatment and the supervision services that are specifically tailored to the risk and need profile of the offender in the criminal justice arena, to respond to that risk and need continuum of the child welfare population, family drug courts may, in fact, offer different tracks that are tabled tailored to the risk and need profile of the family. Does it mean that the in-home cases 
that we don't want to serve in-home cases in the family drug court if there's a high treatment need and there's a high likelihood that they won't be successful in recovery? Probably not. We probably want to put those services in place even though the child is still at home. And again, it's that idea that these are linear connections between the two that we're trying to dispel. The same kinds of contacts that are, are concepts that Doug went through in terms of the low risk and high need in the child welfare world of high, low risk that the child will be harmed in a very short period of time, right, the safety assessment. Am I going to walk out this door and this child is going to be okay? And understanding that there still may be a very high need for substance abuse treatment versus the high risk, high need family in which the child was removed and the parent has a high need for treatment. That's often the population that we do see in family drug courts. But we can also tell you we go to communities in which those are all mixed together and there's not been a clear differentiation between the need for treatment and a low need for substance abuse intervention. So if we think about that in terms of the high risk, high need population, what kinds of risk factors would, be, uh, would we be looking for? What kinds of things would we be looking for in terms of the expectation of the child welfare intervention and services? Um, that these high risk, high need families are more than likely that group that is in out of home care and needs that structure of the drug court with accountability, with treatment availability, with the service array that needs to be put in place to support recovery. Um, they're typically the child welfare focus is about family reunification services and looking at the same time at permanency for the child, how do they ensure that that relationship, particularly for young children, is, is put into place so that that child has a permanent a caregiving relationship with an adult. Uh, the jurisdictional status, typically we're talking about those would be substantiated uh, charges, again, the out-of-home cases, uh, and that we would be thinking about addiction along the terms of uh, mild, moderate, or severe, recognizing that out-of-home care may mean that that scenario that I gave in which there might not be dependence. Um, however, if there's a high need for treatment, um, we would be looking at typically that this would be a parent with uh, severe addiction that has a high need for treatment. So high need for treatment with co-occurring disorders, domestic violence, other services uh, that we know are, are key to being able to reunify. Uh, I'd be remiss without mis mentioning housing in particular. Um, versus the, the low risk, uh, high need family, high need for substance abuse treatment, low risk factors in terms of the child welfare population, no prior allegations, uh, the children are older, no prior criminal history, um, they have protective capacity to mitigate the safety threats. Again, the way in which we're looking at the in-home services uh, that would Able, be able to match that with what's needed for the parent and for the family. Hopefully, if we think about the dependency court uh, in, in ways in which there are family drug courts that are operating with in-home services, so the, the continuum of the dependency court with the referral for an investigation, the investigation happens at that same time, making sure that there's a risk of safety assessment and an alkaline drug treatment need assessment uh, at that point before the referral to the family drug court and putting in place that frequent judicial monitoring. Um, again, in many jurisdictions, um, we have the examples of Sacramento County and Riverside County in particular in California, um, that they have put a family preservation court a early intervention family court in place in which the children are assessed to be at low risk but there is a high need for treatment. The petition for removal uh, in some cases are actually written and held in abeyance. It is the contingency that is put in place 
for participation in substance abuse treatment. Uh, child welfare services are being offered in a family maintenance or preventive kind of capacity. Uh, children are not removed. It does not preclude participation of a family drug court uh, to say that the child was at low risk because we're assessing this parent to be in high need of treatment services with a high degree of structure uh, because they are less likely to enter recovery without those components of structure and frequent judicial monitoring and case management being put in place. Compare that, or contrast, I guess you would say that, with those child welfare interventions in which it's determined that the child is placed in out-of-home care. In that case, that referral, the risk and safety assessment, the alcohol and drug assessment has happened. There's a detention hearing. The child is removed uh, in temporary shelter. An investigation ensues in which there is there are findings of uh, substantiated abuse or neglect. A dispositional hearing is held in which there is a case plan that is put in place and a referral. Um, we like to see it as early as possible with those alcohol and drug assessments happening. In some jurisdictions, we see it in a day or two from the time of the initial referral and detention so that there is a very rapid response to the treatment needs of the parent. Uh, and the entry into the family drug court while the dependency court is going through its typical kinds of uh, timeline for jur jurisdictional and dispositional hearing, but that component of the immediate referral to family drug court based on the alcohol and drug assessment, uh, based on the safety assessment for the child, the child has been removed, and it only makes sense clinically that the response of the system would be as immediate as it possibly could be to get the parent into treatment uh, and to put those uh, judicial monitoring in place so that we've got uh, family unification services that have the component of the frequent court hearings in order to ensure that the parent is able to be successful. We will um, turn to some questions in just a bit, but I want to spend just a minute in thinking about what do we mean by uh, the scale and the scope of family drug courts um, when we're talking about this matching uh, component that we're trying to put in place. By scale, we mean to what extent is your family drug court responding to the children and families in the entire child welfare caseload? By that, we mean both in-home and out-of-home cases, right? There's a large percentage, much larger population of in-home services than the children that are actually removed. When we look nationally at the number of family drug courts and the number of parents that are families that are entering child welfare, our estimate is that family drug courts are serving about 7 to 10 percent of the child welfare population. When we look at that at the national numbers as well as in, in specific jurisdictions, about 10 percent, literally at best in many cases, of those parents who need intensive substance abuse treatment, who need that monitoring, are actually getting into family drug court services. If we're doing that in the context of understanding low risk and high need parents, high risk and high need parents, and then the other two quadrants, can you, in your jurisdiction, fill in those quadrants to say how many of your families fit into those quadrants in a way that makes sense to be able to say what is the scale in your jurisdiction? If you have scarce resources, has your community come together? Has your collaborative come together to say, this is where we're putting our resources in order to get, if you will, the best bang out of our buck in terms of wh which of these quadrants are you going to serve? If you have low risk, low need parents, and I don't think that happens too often, um, that that quadrant of parent uh, ends up in a, a referral to a family drug court, you probably have a pretty high dropout rate because the conditions of a family drug court 
and the amount of structure uh, that's put in place, those are not the folks who need that. They're probably not going to be compliant. They're probably not going to complete. Versus understanding the high risk, high need population and the amount of structure that's needed, and can we put that in place in a way that really facilitates uh, of the recovery for the parent. We're going to ask you to, to do some data then, because if you look in your jurisdiction and say of 100 children that were entering child welfare in your jurisdiction during a, a calendar year, the number of parents associated with those children, we usually use um, you know, 0.7 factor. There are more kids than parents. If you have data that says what percentage of those parents have a substance use component that needs treatment, right, the number that need treatment, they're affected by substance use, um, if you have 60% or 80%, um, if you haven't found that prevalence rate, we'd encourage you to do a case review and add it up and see to what extent are the families coming into child welfare affected by a parent substance use disorder? How many kids does that mean? What's your current annual capacity for parents? It's not unusual to see something in the range of uh, 20 or 25 uh, at, compared to some jurisdictions that have uh, a whole system approach that have three, 400 parents at a time that are in this continuum of services. Uh, but what's your capacity for parents? You might say, well, that's being driven by our capacity for treatment, or that's being driven by our capacity for case management. Unless you know these data about what your capacity is in the current scale for parents, in this example, 38%, um, you can't go back to your board of supervisors. You can't go back to your to your state legislators and say, we need to expand the capacity for treatment. We need to expand the capacity of case management. We need to expand the capacity of the court in order to meet the full needs of parents and children in our community unless you've run through those data to understand what your capacity is, what your scale is, what your need is in terms of services. One of the questions that came in uh, previously on the on the webinar uh, was about how do you how do you get those resources if you are have a population of high risk high need parents but you have a wait list. My first question back with to you is what is the capacity for treatment in your community? Because I will tell you I have never been to a state or to a local county in which the number of treatment admissions was not at least two to three times higher than the entire number of parents who could possibly have been served. Does that mean that they have treatment on demand for this high risk, high need population of parents? Typically, no. There are other priorities of who's getting into those treatment slots, but the treatment slots I hate to say this because I'm probably going to get myself in trouble, are typically there. There are treatment admissions in your community. Your task is to understand who's getting into those treatment slots. Often they're parents whose children may be at risk of abuse or neglect, but they are not necessarily categorized as being involved in the child welfare system. We don't necessarily want them involved in the child welfare system, but unless you know what population it is that's using the treatment resources in your community, then saying there's just a wait list. Who's on that wait list? Is that your local policy about who the priority is? Or is this two-generation program of children and parents a priority? Now, if we could wave magic wands, we would say no one would sit on a wait list. We would be able to have the capacity to serve all persons who are making a demand on the system. But we also know that there's an awful lot of folks who, if you will, enter the treatment system and don't stick. What is that about in your community? 
What is the less than 30 day dropout rate in your community? How do you say that those resources are being best used in your community if you haven't looked at the data to understand who gets admitted to treatment, how long do they stay in treatment, what's the overlap already with this high risk, high need population that's known to child welfare? Will that solve all of your resource issues? No, but in the era of expanded resources that we've never seen before, uh, through both the Affordable Care Act, if you're in a state that's expanded Medicaid, even if you haven't, uh, to understand the data behind, we just get a referral to a wait list. When we really work with a community to understand that wait list, we typically find that resources may be there and what we really need to understand is who's the priority in that community. So calculating your penetration rate is one of those really important factors about how you look at the family drug court policy in your community. How do family drug courts serve a larger proportion of the risk and need? in the child welfare population, and again, what's the strategy in order to understand the scale of your family drug court? Who's getting in, who needs to be in, who's in treatment, and who needs to be in treatment from the child welfare population? With that, I'm going to uh, turn things over for us to have a few questions. We have a little bit of time for that. But I, I want to end with this idea before we, we have some questions and then, um, and then make sure that folks are aware of the resources that are available through the Family Drug Court uh, Training and Technical Assistance Program that we believe, I guess this is a, a, a children and family futures, but that uh, statement, but that family drug courts have not just the opportunity, but they have the responsibility to make sure that they're drawing on the strengths of those structured assessments and that they are drawing on the strengths of the alcohol and drug treatment and I must add prevention system in terms of this high risk uh, population of kids who are at very high risk of developing their own substance use disorder and the prevention resources that are in communities to make sure that we are really understanding how to better serve families that are affected by parents with substance abuse issues and making sure that we're serving and being strategic about our resources as we think about this whole continuum of services. Um, with that, let me um, turn to a couple of the questions. Um, the first one is to, to Doug. Um, can the ranch be used as an assessment tool with participants in family drug courts? Doug? Yes, so uh, for those of you who don't know, RANT, uh, R-A-N-T, uh, stands for Risk and Needs Triage. It's an assessment tool that I developed at the University of Pennsylvania a number of years ago. I am not at uh, that facility anymore. They still uh, market and, and uh, use the tool, but I'm not, I don't have any financial or other involvement with it. <clears throat> it's developed to put people into those four quadrants, whether someone's high risk, high need, low risk, low need. and to set the conditions of supervision and treatment in a drug court. It has been validated and used very successfully in the criminal side. To my knowledge, there has never been a study using it in a family drug court. So, um, you know, the scientific answer is no. There's no, I mean, not no that it can't be, no that there's no evidence one way or the other. I don't know. Um, uh, so I think based on some of the predictor variables that um, Nancy was talking about earlier, my guess is that a lot of the risk and need factors are very similar and it probably could be used. It may need to be augmented with some of the um, child and family constellation variables, but it, it, my sense is it could be used, but the, the scientific answer is I don't know until somebody actually does it and studies it. Okay, um, thanks, Doug. Uh, another question that came in is in um, about one of the slides that I used in terms of calculating the family drug court penetration uh, rate and the example. I believe I said substance use disorders when I 
spoke because I noticed that it said just substance use. So that, that slide should say the parents that are affected by substance use disorders. And understanding the penetration rate means that you understand the different quadrants of those parents who, uh, again, in the old terminology of use and abuse, um, versus those who are addicted. Uh, knowing that continuum means that you understand what percentage have addiction of the child welfare population. And the other comment is that it still feels like it's kind of gray, that we haven't really settled on, you know, what is the, the population of, of folks who should be in family drug courts. And, it, and I would direct that back to, to the individual jurisdictions. Uh, if we understand we're not mixing treatment individuals, people that need treatment who have, have addiction and who are not addicted, if we understand we're not mixing that population, and yet there may be a very strong uh, uh, priority in your community to provide the services for the in-home population, does that mean that that is not a drug court population? If they have uh, low risk factors for child abuse and neglect and high need for treatment, I think that's the example that we were trying to give to say that there may be some uh, need or there may be a priority for a family drug court to serve the, the in-home population, but it's based on the need for treatment. It's not based on the risk of the child. If that, I, I hope, is, is clear as we went through all of those explanations. But in fact, your jurisdiction may say that our out-of-home care population, there's, there are some states that we're familiar with, that has a, they have a very high removal rate. Almost, it's much more likely for the child to be removed than to get in-home services. So in that context, you would want those, that priority population of the removed child because you're going to get a much bigger, again, payoff in terms of the reduction in out-of-home care costs by focusing on that out-of-home care population, making sure that the treatment needs for that population are being met so that you can get those very low return uh, to out-of-home care rates that we've seen demonstrated from family drug court interventions. So I, I don't want to be, you know, wishy-washy in saying, you know, well, what's the final answer about who should we be serving? Um, I'll be a, a good um, uh, person, a social worker kind of person that says, well, it depends. And it does depend on the local context of do you have a, an alternative response program in your community that says most of your families are being served in home or are referred to community resources. And in fact, that you look at your data over time and you find that there are three, four, five kinds of child abuse reports that come in for those in home cases or those deferred cases that you say, we've got to get a handle on this and keep these kids from having the repeat maltreatment or the repeat reports that eventually generate an out-of-home care. And if your jurisdiction is not that kind of a context of your child welfare population, then you need to be focusing on, of those deferred cases, in-home cases, how many of those actually have parents with addiction that need the structure of a family drug court in order to be successful in treatment. So uh, we'd be happy to have further conversation about that. I, I think that that idea about really understanding assessment is something that crosses over between criminogenic risk and risk of abuse and neglect and understanding the need for treatment and how that population uh, might look in your own community to make sure that um, that you're targeting in a way that meets your own community's needs. I think that we have hit our time on questions. There are some others that uh, if you have additional questions that weren't addressed, we'd appreciate uh, the follow-up with us uh, to make sure that we're addressing those questions. Um, we want you to visit our blog. 
uh, if uh, we could change to make sure that we get the, the, the other resources with the blog spot uh, link for you. Uh, in the follow-up to this webinar, we will get an email with the PowerPoint presentation uh, as well as the link to share this with your colleagues if you think it's been helpful and you'd like for folks to be able to view this uh, after it's posted to our website, uh, you'll be able to do that. The webinar recording uh, will be posted and that will be uh, emailed out to you. Uh, you can also visit the blog to look for the other resources that are available from uh, from Doug in, in particular on those uh, issues related to targeting. Uh, we have some of his other materials that are on the blog spot and we'd, we'd encourage you to visit that. Uh, we want to make sure that you're familiar with the Family Drug Court Peer Learning Court program. Uh, if you're not, uh, let us know. We have at present four uh, Family Drug Courts that have agreed to be uh, peer mentors on various components of establishing and running family drug courts. Uh, again, uh, send us an email if you have some questions about that, uh, making sure that we, we know that you have some questions. Also, resources available in terms of free tutorials that are available on the National Center on Substance Abuse and Child Welfare website. Uh, you see the link there. Uh, for the tutorials for child welfare workers, for substance abuse treatment, and for legal professionals. We're just about at 50,000 people who have taken our uh, online tutorial. So uh, it's been a, a resource that's been very helpful for jurisdictions around the country. Uh, in fact, we have about eight states that require uh, all of their frontline child welfare workers to take the online course on understanding substance abuse and facilitating recovery. So we're delighted with the response that we've seen uh, from those. And, and uh, again, they're a free resource, so that's always very, uh, very helpful as we get to the end of the year and folks are looking for uh, CEUs. Uh, our contact information, please feel free to uh, contact us, with, again, with any further questions. Let me take a moment to uh, say thank you again to Dr. Marlowe for sharing with us today. This is the final webinar of our 2014 series, uh, but we will be having a 2015. We will see you then. Uh, and uh, take a moment, if you would, as you exit to complete our evaluation. Uh, it will help shape the content of the 2015 webinar series. Uh, and uh, we always appreciate the feedback of what's working and what's not working so that we can adjust to, to uh, better meet the needs of the family drug court community in the country. Thank you again, Doug. Thanks so much for all of the participants today, and we'll see you next time.